Okay, hi Max. Okay, Max, I want, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna ask you about three people. Frank, Dolly, four people. Frank, Dolly, Lillian, and Marvin. And we're gonna go from one to the other. So let's start with Frank. Tell me about your personal relationship with Frank and your memories and any stories you have. Frank to me was a saint and to everybody else. He was a man that taught me so much in life that I, books can't teach me what he did. He had etiquette, he had poise, he was class, he dressed immaculately, and he had such a brain that no one could ever replace him, period. I met him in 1948, October the 1st, when I opened up the chicken roost, and since then he has been a friend of mine and a friend of all the people in Hamilton, not only myself. What he did for people, there isn't another person that ever will do it, no one. And the beauty part of it is, no one knew it. He sensed people, he read people, he looked at people, and he knows what time it was. One of the stories that I can say to you was, and this could be a repeat, by the way, because maybe I mentioned this before, when my brother died, and uh, our business was good, we had business money was coming in, and he used to come in every Saturday, you know, to our, to our, for lunch, at the chicken the back room, George, Morley, and him, and then he brought Levinson and all that. And I never knew that I never carried money. So that when they stood up, they said, we have no money. I said, what are you worried about? So there's no problem, you'll, you'll pay later. Well, since then, I, they came in every Saturday, and I never, never charged them for lunch on a Saturday, never. But it was my pleasure, not theirs. And they're fighting all the time. Actually, you gotta pay it. But they paid many times over by, by coming in the roost and supporting me, and, and any time I needed me, it was there. But the beauty part, when my brother died, there was a story that I, I can't believe. I got a call from Frank Oblett on Robert Street he was. You know, he had a big, beautiful little office with a round chair. I want to see it. I said, Frank, what do you want to see me about? You know, I got problems with my brother, and, and at the time it was, it was, it was no, Will was, it was awful. So I went down and he's sitting in the round table, and he said, I want to know all about you. What trouble are you in? I never spoke to that man. I never bothered, I never bothered anyone. Who am I going to tell? I said, what well, trouble? I'm not trouble. I said, yes, you are, and you need help. And he had a big piece of paper and a pencil, and he says, I tell me everything, he started writing down. I said, there's nothing for me to tell. He says, yes, you're gonna tell me before you leave this office. From nowhere he called me, nowhere in the world. I said, I says, yes, I got problems with straight. I says, what's your problem? I said, the problem is there was no will, and now they want everything, and I want everything, and it's a mess. He says, okay, what do you need? So I told him everything about Millie and I. Millie wasn't wrong either, neither was I wrong, but you know, the lawyers were wrong. Both lawyers were like, you know, they wanted terrible. It was awful. The public relation was down the drain and everything, and there was kids involved. And it wasn't me, it wasn't her, it was... Anyhow, he sat down and he said, give me, the, give me your problem. So I told him everything, and don't you think for one minute that he told me how to handle Millie? how to handle Bill Schreiber, how to handle everybody, and it straightened out with his words. And then, the best part was, Dolly called about six o'clock. I love it for six o'clock. Frank, where you son of a bitch, where are you? I got dinner on the table. He said, I got a European buyer here, and I can't come home. And I was a European buyer. I says, Frank, go on home. He says, no, 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 tell me everything. And then after telling him everything, she called again, Frank, where are you? He said, I'm coming home in a few minutes, and so he did. But before he left, he said, Maxie, you need help. He took me to the bank of CIBC, and I'll show you a note upstairs. I got a letter from him, by the way. I must show you that letter upstairs. And he signed for me for $50,000. He wore a gray hat, a raincoat, and he's bothering me. I says, Frank, I can't pay you back. I said, don't do it. I will straighten my life out. It's nothing at all. It's just a matter of time. Business is good. It's just the understanding between Millie and me and the lawyers. Once the lawyers get in, never hire a lawyer unless you need them, really, because they are trouble, trouble, trouble. So he loaned me the $50,000. No signature, no nothing, no mortgage, no nothing. It's like the angel coming. And of course, I paid everybody off, and I paid them off as well. 
And from there on, it just started a relation, not the kind of money. I love the man. Anybody knew must love him. I mean, the stories around that I can tell you because I was there. Every Saturday, he used to come in. And one day, George Morley was not the type. Morley was a good person, but a different direction altogether. He was a church man. He came out of the church, you know, which is wonderful, by, by the way. So uh, George said to Frank, he says, you know what, Frank, we had a bad day today. No one came around for money. Every Friday used to give out money to a guy with a beard, you know. Every Friday they came around. And one time, your father, Mar Marvin, get out of here, get out of here. So they went away, and then he called Frank Hollenbeck and threw money out through the window. <laughs> through the window, a few bucks, you know, a few dollars. And uh, what can I say about a guy like him? I know he had a driver by name, Walter, the black gentleman. He worked for Walter, was, uh, I was very sad this morning. He said, so Frank says, what is the matter, Walter? He says, well, I, nothing, uh, Mr. Frank. He says, tell me, I know. He, he was like, the guy was an angel. The guy was a, right through you. So he says, well, I got to move again. When he said he's got to move again, what do you mean? Is the house for sale? He turned around and bought the Walter the house. When Frank was sick, he had nurses, because he, we were very close with him. He used to tell me, and I used to tell him, you know, and he looked after the nurse with everything she needed in finance. Never asked a nickel. Now, I had a partner, I'm making it short for you. There's a lot of stories in between. That, and uh, Frank never told anything. He did things, never told anyone. So when I was settling my differences with Henry Bader, Leo Barnett come in, the, the, my landlord, and he says, unless you straighten me out, there is no lease because we were signing a new lease because we were breaking up because Henry did a lot of crazy things. I said, Lee, what do you want from me? I never, you never asked me to lend, lend the money. You don't lend the money. You got 17% or 12%. What do you want from me now? Why didn't you come over to me and ask me before? He says, well, he said, I want my money. If not, there is no, 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 no lease. I said, what do you want from me? I never, I never knew he owed you money. He got paid. The lawyer said, well, you got to pay him if not, there's no lease. So finally, I found out that Frank Goldblatt loaned money to Henry Bader and Rosie Bader. So when I found out, I called, I called uh, Frank and says, Frank, he owes you 7500 Barnett came in here and he got paid for nothing. I didn't know he owes it to him. Now I can say, unless he, pay, unless he pays you, I'm not sending no deal. I want to protect you. Why did you tell me you loaned the money, Frank? Well, he doesn't tell anybody, you know. He says, don't worry about it, I'll get paid. He says, Frank, no, you won't get paid. I know these people, they're nice people, they're in debt. I can pay another. He says, don't worry about them, I'm not worried, anyhow. We can't have the phone ringing in this oh. interview. Hold on. First of all, you got something on your lip right here. Second of all, I'm just gonna do this. Sure. That's fine. Okay? Yep. Because if it rains, yeah, sure, sure, sure. it cancels it out. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Anyhow, so Frank says, I'll get my money. I says, Frank, you won't get your money. Let me protect you. I can get your money. He says, no. So he didn't, and he never got his money. He finally wrote him a letter, and he told him that um, he owe me 7500 and I understand you're doing well because they, I, got, I saw him in the jet at the time and he took over to stake us across the street and they were making money and they were gambling, always gambling. So they wrote him back a letter. Rosie Bader, Rosie Bader wrote him a letter. Yes, you did lend me 7500 but it's after seven years and I don't have to pay you. You don't have to pay after seven years. And that's what happened there. But the stories about him, where do I start with this fellow? Where do I end? There's no, there's no, he was a dry humor. He was, mind you, your father's trying to copy him up to a point. But Frank was an individual. So was George, so was Morley. But Frank, what can I tell you about him, Frank? There's no words that I can tell you. There's, there's not enough books to be written about this man. Okay, hold on, it's two seconds. Wait, go like this. All right, let me see. It's gone. All right, wasn't there a story was that fifty thousand dollars story you told me? Was there another story about him financing you to open a restaurant, or was that the same story? That was the same story. The yeah, same because story. when I was in trouble, he financed me to get rid of all the debts to Millie and all the lawyers and everything. Because though business was good, 
But the vets were came in very heavily, very fast. And you know, two restaurants at that time? I had, we had three restaurants, one in London, one the Jet, and one in Hamilton. Okay, so, but that's the, that's yes. the famous story. That yes, you yes, yes, yes. Okay, um, so he used to come, Frank, every Saturday. To every Saturday for lunch, at the, after shoe. After shoe. After shoe. And who would he come with? Well, he, was, he invited guests, and I was honored to have him. He invited uh, 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 Levinson, the, 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 the shoe man, you know. Mr. Levinson? Levinson? Levinson. Yeah, the shoe. Charlie. Charlie and then yeah. he invited uh, Goldhar from Finley Fish, and he also invited people from London, Ontario, if they were in here. Yeah. He invited anybody he wanted. It was an open book. There was no, no, no charge. And he used to fight with me. But he supported me with, with business that... So he'd also come during the week? Oh, during the week, all the time. Him and Dolly and, and Mo Rapkin and all the people, every Saturday, he, would, he wouldn't go any other place except the chicken roost. Every day, that, almost. Pretty well every other day, every day for yeah. lunch and everything like that. And, yeah. and, uh, and he would, uh, you know, he would make him anything he wants. His, the restaurant was all his. I mean, what words can't order? describe. He ordered most of the basic foods. He loved sardines. He loved raw onion. He loved beet borscht. He, meat, no, not that much, you know. But uh, uh, he ordered think, basic foods, solid basic foods. Herring, he loved herring. I used to get a schmaltz herring out of the barrel. From from uh, uh, there was a store on King Street, uh, Kepik store, and he, he loved that schmaltz. He loved basic, earthy Polish food, and he he never complained. Doesn't matter. Yes, it's good. No, it's good. you know. It, he never complained. Never, never complained. He's. Uh, so tell me now about Dolly and the relationship Dolly. between the two of them. Dolly, Dolly Goldman. <laughs> Valley. How can, a book can't be written about this woman. First of all, she used to come with clothes that no one, no one ever touched her. Immaculate, tall. Her nails are done. She used to smell so beautiful. And even now, when I go near her, she smells gorgeous. And her favorite word, Stig Dreck. <laughs> Stig Dreck, she used to say. And coming, Dolly was Dolly Goldblatt with the two sisters. Dolly was an individual person. No, no holes bars with her. No holes were barred with her. She used to, she used to sit down, Maxie, this is very good. Why, Frank, don't eat this. Don't eat this. Not good for you. Not good for you. Eat this. Eat this. And she used to drive him crazy, you know. <laughs> but he ate, he, he, before she came in, he used to have a vodka. He loved vodka and tomato juice. So he says, give me a vodka before she comes in, fast, 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 I double. I get, but then I cut it out for him. Then I used to give him tomato juice, very little vodka. Because, you know, I didn't want to. But Dolly, huh. Dolly, there's no one around Dolly. If God forbid Dolly goes, there's no more Dolly. There's no person that can take her place. With the words, with the walk, with the height, with the width, with the smile. She got away with murder. Anything she said, she can get away. No one, no, no one can get away with it. Muriel back and her, two people got away with things that no one else could get away with. Not, not ostentatious, not bad, but things that she faced as she told you. You like it? Take it. You don't like it? That's your problem. But uh, what can you say about Dolly? She's an individual person. Heart of gold. Bottom line, she's a heart of gold. You know, and uh, protective about her kids and protective about Marvin and about Abby and all of them. You have no idea. I mean, I was with them every day, you know, every day. And uh, they were just great people. What can I tell you more? I'm repeating myself, but what words can I find for them? If I was an author, I couldn't say anything better. Uh, what were they like together, Dolly and Frank? Dolly and Frank were very good together. You know, the same as my wife and you and the same as your husband, you know. Take a look what he eats. Take a look what he does. Why do you eat this? Why do you eat this? The herring. It's no good for you with the thing. It's, this is no good. That's good. Why do you eat this, Frank? Why do you eat this? Oh, Dolly. It's fine, Dolly. And after a while, they settled down. <laughs> it, it was a, a showpiece. It was, they cared for each other in their own little way. But uh, they got on beautifully. The respect was there. Come on. There's no, there was not a person in the world that, had, that Frank, the respect that Frank had. I wish more people would learn the etiquette that he had. Never spoke about a person bad. If he couldn't say anything good, he never spoke bad. With Henry Bader, when he never paid 7500 he said, don't worry, I'll get paid, it's not the end. I mean, how can you, he said, I'm telling you, I'm saying to you as a saint. Not only because he did things to me, he did for, for everybody. There's not a person that the man's door was always open, period. With kindness, with soft wording. He made you feel that he's the guy that needs it and you don't need it. That's how he made you feel. When you went into his office, 
It's like I'm the only person in the world for him. Sit down, Max, have a drink. Have the, he catered to everybody, not only to me, but to everybody. Was George like that too? George was his own way, yeah. He was a nice guy. George was a wonderful person as well. Yeah, George was the same way, pretty well. Frank was an individual, you know. Frank, uh, uh, for, <laughs> but Max Stein's wife passed away, and, and you know, she used to look after him like crazy, you know. Max Stein's, uh, don't eat this, Max, don't eat this. She used to bring the pills, they the pills, and eat this, and eat this. When she died about three months later, four months later, all of a sudden Max got new suits, walks in with a tie, walks in with this, and one day when he got married to the Pachetchka in Toronto. Bernice. <laughs> Bernice, you yeah. know, Bernice with a little hanky all the time she walked. <laughs> he says, he says, he's carrying a bag. I think I told you this before, but it was funny. It's, it, he's carrying a bag. What is, so Frank, what have you got there? Flowers for Bernice. So, so uh, uh, Max says, I've got to go to the washroom. So Frank took the flowers and threw them in the garbage. <laughs> he came up and he says, where are the flowers? He says, did you ever buy flowers for your first wife? You son of a bitch. <laughs> you bought Bernice flowers? Go in the back garbage. That's where they are. <laughs> Frank said that? Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, between four of us, you know. Uh, he, uh, he, never, he didn't swear, you know. But among some of you get crazy a little bit and you let your thing out, you know. Uh, but he was, no, he never swore, no. But uh, he was funny man, he was a dry sense of humor, you know. He was funny. He come in and, and he, the, oh, God almighty. He used to tell stories that weren't even true, you know, and I listened to them and, and I says, Frank, he says, no, no your, your father's trying to do the same thing, but he'll never make it, never. There's only one Frank all right around. Well, who does my father take after more, Frank or Dolly? Both. Mostly well, Frank, but the way he talks, the way he, sometimes he, he does this and he does, he does certain things that I remember, uh, 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 repeats himself certain little things that Frank used to say all the time. Like what? Seriously speaking, Max? Yeah, seriously speaking, uh, what's new, have you got anything to tell me? I mean, he, he, he had, but some of Dolly's stuff, he loves them both, there's not a son. And great respect, may rest in peace to Abby, and I'm sure, I didn't know Abby as well. There's not a son like, like, like Marvin Goldblatt. And there's not a person that cares like Marvin Goldblatt with all his loudness. When he's, when he's loud and he speaks, just to let his nerves out, but he's the same as Frank Goldblatt. Bottom line, he'll never let you go out unless you're satisfied. He's got time for you, whether you're poor, rich, or indifferent. He talks a lot. He, he means, he does a lot of actions, but nothing means that. He's nothing. He's a pussycat. Yeah, pussy again, but he tries, he, not, he doesn't try, that's not true. He does the same thing if it was with his father all the time, you know. So things rub off. No, but he's a, Marvin is a dear friend of everybody's. I mean, he hollers, he does this, he does that, but bottom line, down boy, and he comes through with everything. So you don't think he's more Levy than Goldblatt? He's more your father than his mother, some of the mothers, you know. Mother, mother, are you all right? Mother, are you taking the check? I'm, give mother the check. Mother, you're ordering too much food, which costs money, uh, costs money. Dolly, shut up, Marvin, you talk too much. But, but Dolly, Molly, you're ordering, too, it costs too much money, Marvin. Can't you order something else, Dolly? That's cheaper, you know? But he loves her, oh, he loves her. When he, he goes into the restaurant, uh, when I ran Maxwell's, his, uh, the food for Dolly had to be on, and everything she wanted was her, 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 her. Give her that check. Give me, give my son the check. Give her the check. Give the son the check. And your mother said, "Give me the check. <laughs> I'll take the check." <laughs> they, they, they're a wonderful family. What can I tell you? They're individual people. People don't know the goodness. Sure, people know what Frank and the Goblins did for the city. For everybody. Jewish, Chinese, black, colored, it doesn't matter, the door is open all the time, always open. And the Marvin is the same way, basically, but he hollers, why, 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 why? I said, holler all you want, Marvin, come down, boy, and he comes through. Not only with money, with, with, with brains, Marvin is a clever man in my eyes, very shrewd, same as Frank, different way, you know. But Frank used to dress, he, you know, he was the 10th best dressed man in Canada at one time. In fact, I learned a lot of Frank, you know, I, I worked close, I tried to, you know, it, he taught me a lot, Frank. Frank taught me a lot, 
how to cope, how to talk, how to self talk. And I try to copy Frank because I copy good people. And he's, he was uh, like a saint. I mean, and I'm saying the word saint, which is a, oh my God, he's crazy, Max. But when you knew him as much as I did, and what he did for people, the, boy, the beauty part, I never told anybody. I mean, you know, I do things, I like to tell somebody sometimes, you know, you know, it's, it's the poor kid that came up well, and here I am helping out people. In a small way, I've learned how to, by Frank Gold, how to give money away to people. Because my parents, you know, they were poor, and what did they do? They had to be in the oven, make bread, and make the chalice, and make everything, but, uh, so I wasn't trained to do it, but in the last 15, 20 years, when I, Frank taught me a lot, a lot in life. Really a lot. I used to look forward to seeing him and talking to him. And everybody else did too. And, uh, in fact, he wore suede shoes, not about the same pair as him from Levinson's. I still got him upstairs. He was just a great man, and I'm repeating myself a lot of phrases here, but I can't st tell you enough about him. Tell me about your tennis games with Marvin. Oh, have you got five, have you got a year? <laughs> Marvin Goldblatt is a marvelous person. I love the guy. We lo I think he, he He's, he can't see sometimes. I think he can, but he cheats. Out, in, in, out. I says, Marvin, yeah, we played yesterday. Well, it was June the 16th. One ball. I says, Marvin, that ball hit the tape. I heard it. It did not hit the tape. I says, yes, it did hit the tape. Marvin, we go right up to the net. And I says, Marvin, I'll pay you for a new, you got a new eye, take it out, I'll put a new one and I'll pay for it. That ball hit the tape, that was three, four minutes. I want you to end up fighting back and forth. Now the next ball, he hits me, out. That ball was out? I says, yeah, was my ball out? He says, I don't know. I said, well, I don't know your ball either. So I got even with him. He doesn't get away anything with me, but we enjoy each other, we enjoy our games, they're challenging. Uh, he, I buy him outfits. So I shouldn't be ashamed of with his shirts. He's got bear, little bear. I says, I, he saves the feel. I buy him a feel outfit and he saves it. Marvin, what are you saving it for? Well, it's too good to play. It's too hot. I'm sweating. I don't want to do it. <laughs> he never uses it. But he uses your mother, your grandmother, Dolly, bought him a beautiful outfit. Feel it. Never wears it. It's too good. I can't wear it now because it's raining. It's, it's moist. It's gonna it's gonna get spoiled. No, I'm wearing it for another day. He never wears it, but he wears these damn things that, 20 years old. He's got shoes that I want to go up and throw them away already. What are you talking about? These shoes are brand new. <laughs> the, the front goes up, the side goes down. But he's a marvelous person again. I, I he's a good father, a good person. Solomon Gran is very clever. As I would put him the same as Frank. He's got a brain. He hollers, but that's okay. That's part of his life. There's nothing wrong with that. You want to you want to be with him? That's his way. You don't want to be with him? Don't be his way. But he doesn't mean any harm. He will never hurt you. Never will he. He'll only do good for you. Is there a story that you want to tell me about some lady at the tennis courts that her husband was going to come after Marvin with a gun or something? No, I don't want to tell that story. <laughs> no, <laughs> Marvin. No. <laughs> I won't put it on anything, I swear. <laughs> Just a habit. Okay. Marvin Goldblatt fools around, you know. He doesn't fool around with girls, you know. But he likes the kibitz. Yeah. Now, we're at the tennis court, and this girl likes him. I mean, he's to be liked. Once you get to know his personality, yeah. you, you go crazy with him, you know. Yeah. And he said, <laughs> I says, Marvin, what are you doing? She's a young girl. What are you doing? You know, she can't take it. Her husband is, is a rough guy. What are you doing? So, so now he goes by, and as he goes by, she watches him, and he does this. <laughs> I said, Marvin, don't do that. You're going to get into trouble, Marvin. Please. Not in trouble. And I know he didn't touch her. He did. He did that. But he likes a lot of fun. And if the other person can take it, then he has to make a long story short. I don't want to say anything after that. I, I don't want to tell the story. Well, you can tell. I'm not going to use no. it. Make sure your mic's still on. Well, to make a long story short, the husband. No, the husband, nothing. I, I don't want to say You had to no. warn him, didn't you? I swear no, I'm not going to use this, just for posterity. I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to, no, I, I'm not going to say anything. No. The husband comes after him. You found <laughs> out that the husband was coming after him, and you had to warn him, right? <laughs> I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. <laughs> oh, Max. All right, well, there, are there any other stories you can tell besides that? You haven't got enough time to listen to the stories yeah. between him and I and, and Frank and everything like that, right. but Marvin Goldblatt. All right, tell me about Lil. 
Oh, she was a lady. She was a lady. But she was afraid to spend money. We were down in California. The height of it, the beautiful looks and everything. Well, of course, Marvin, Marvin, Marvin. Lil, keep quiet. Marvin, you son of a bitch. <laughs> so uh, Lil was a lady, height, the width, the length, the strength. And she went out, you had to look at her. So we're playing tennis, and she's got a racket and antique. I says, Lillian, buy a new racket. She had an outfit on. She wore beautiful clothes, you know, but they pressed elegant, nicely. So I didn't know that, you know. So she said to my wife, how long do you think I'm going to use the racket? Well, I broke up. You know, I didn't know she was that sick. Because when we went to California, I had a room in a hotel, and we couldn't get a room, so I gave up my room for her, and we went to the embassy hotel, which was fine, because I thought they should be, after I found out six, she was, they'll let me be alone, and I'll call them whenever we need them, you know. So we used to meet every morning, and she used to come out with the old racket, and uh, finally I says, well, give me your racket, and you play with mine. And I did. And she did. And she wouldn't buy a new racket. But my wife made her buy a new skirt. Made her. How long am I going to use it? You know, I broke up. I mean. Was this that last trip? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I didn't know she was got three months or four months, you know, but she looked beautiful and everything like that. And finally, it's just, oh, she looked gorgeous. No matter what she wore, she looked gorgeous. Her legs, her height, her smile, her hair, her nose, her eyes, you know. Uh, she was a very kind lady. She loved Marvin dearly. Oh, and Marvin loved her dearly. And I, we lost a good friend, you know. It's, uh, she was a special person. She was a special person. What can I tell you more about her? The last time when I went to hospital, Marvin called us, and I saw her, and I said goodbye, and that's why I got to live for today. I must tell you, I have no more, I have no birthdays. When my brother died, I learned a lot. I believe in birthdays every day. I don't have to wait to my 10th anniversary, or first anniversary of my life, I watch, or if you got the money. A birthday is every day, and I want you to know this, and you can put it on, you can put it on the camera anywhere. You don't wait for birthdays to buy gifts. You buy a gift the next day if you can afford it. That's your birthday right there because you don't know if you're going to wear it. Think like my brother, it's 11 o'clock at night and four in the morning he was dead. What, what, do we, what for? I was brought up not to wear Gucci, not to wear the shoes if it's going to rain. I would wear these shoes if it was snow five feet high. I don't know if I'm going to wear these shoes the next day. Don't save anything. But there's no birthdays with me on a day. Yes, there's a birthday on a day, that's fine. But I really don't believe in birthdays. Birthdays is every day when you get up. That's your birthday. That's your strength, that's your width. That's what it's all about today. And people, I learned through tragedy, through my brother. And you can't learn it reading a paper. Oh, he died. It's gotta ha God forbid it's gotta happen to you. Then you realize, what is life all about? So, birthdays to me mean nothing. Anniversaries mean nothing. I mean, they mean a lot, but nothing. Uh, if my wife wanted a watch or something, buy it right away if I got the money. Wear it. I don't know if I'm going to see it tomorrow, if she can wear it or not. How do I know? So that's my philosophy in life. Wear everything, enjoy everything. Uh, share those life tragedies. Of course, that's part of life. You can't go through without that, you know. You can't go through without problems. But make your problems easier. I make it a point that if I don't get along with the person, I do, I try to get along with people. I just walk away, and two things I learned. Rabbi Green, when I catered, there's always a little problem, you know. He says, look, Maxie, never argue with people. Say you're right. And that's it. That's the end of the conversation. You're right. And that's what I do. You're right, Wendy. And that's it. And my daughter, Sharon, taught me another thing. That's a good idea. And that's where it ends, that's a good idea. And one politician taught me another one. Leave it with me. And that's where it's left, with her. No date, no nothing. So life goes on. And you learn off people. What can I tell you more than that? Tell me, um, did you used to travel? Tell me about your trips with my mom and my dad before she got sick. Oh God, we traveled, we had so much fun. We went to Greece on a boat with Sorry. 
and we rented a private boat out of Greece. I'll show you the boat up. It was great, the fun and laughter and go and run and dance. She used to love dancing, your mother. And she used to, I used to, wherever there's a piano, nightclub, wherever we went, I, I, I sang and she played the piano. <laughs> and uh, she used to have a beautiful voice. Beautiful voice. And we traveled all over England. We went to, what can I tell you about your traveling? Traveling was just unbelievable. And the beauty part, we thought the same way. You know, we were never, whoever said we're going to go to uh, this restaurant, fine, no problem. Whoever said it first, it wasn't such a, why do you go to a restaurant? Why do you do this and why do you do that? It was just wonderful to go with them. And we had so much fun and respect. The word respect means love. If you have no respect, you got nothing in life. Yeah, we can fight with Marvin, it means nothing, but the respect is there after it's over. And that's one of the most important things in life, respect. And that, going back, Frank, there's no one in this world, and I met a lot of them, through the catering, through, the, through my travels, through the chicken roost, through Maxwell's, that had more respect than Frank Goldberg. Frank Goldberg, I've never heard him, that I've known him for 40, 40 years, ever said a word about bad about anybody. No one. I mean, the odd time you gotta say, you son of a bitch. Not him, never. And uh, your father's a special person. Your father's a, you know, you, what can I tell you about your father? <laughs> you gotta know your father by now. But so are you, by the way, Wendy. You're very smart, he's lucky he's got daughters. But you're, you're a very, you I know more than the other daughters, you know. And I'm not bragging about you, but you're, you're a journalist, you're clever, you get words out of me that no one else would. <laughs> And you're a good listener, and I'm trying to, by the way, I'm reading a book on how to listen. My big problem is I don't listen, but I'm getting much, much, much better. Do you think if I asked Samith to come here and say a few words about my mother? Oh, she sure, she would. Oh, of course I she really would. like that. Of like, course she would. She had a relationship with oh, my mom. Oh, she? yes. Oh, yes. So did I. She was a special lady, your mother. She used to sing with my, you're a singer too. Yeah, yeah, sang. I could, I, of course so. I used to sing always when I was a piano, little, come on in a little sing. Oh, promise me that someday you and I, <laughs> you know, and sang, we sang, we sang in plays. What together you With Muriel Back. With my mother, which ones, do you remember? Anything? I don't remember right now. Do you want to shut up and get my Sabbath? Say goodbye. Goodbye and thank you very much. It was a delight talking to you and you about your family and everybody else. Thank you. Hey, wait. Careful the mic. Yeah, no, no, oh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah, of course yeah. I will. She'd be happy to. Yeah, you're very, I like that shirt you wore for the occasion. Nice color on you. Oh, thank you very much. Sabbath! How you and Abby met? Well, actually, I knew um, Debbie Moses, Debbie Goldblatt, before I knew Abby. Uh, she was a girlfriend of mine. She, when I first moved to Hamilton, I lived in London, Ontario, and uh, I moved here when I was 12, and I knew no one, and uh, only my cousin Bunny, who is a year and a half older than me, and her friends were about a year and a half older than her, so there was a big difference in age with my girlfriends. And um, so when I ca first came here, Debbie was almost a little over, almost three years older than me. And, uh, but we became very good friends. And uh, so I met Debbie Goldblatt and Jesse Goldblatt and George before I knew Abby or Abby's family. Actually, I knew Sori quite well because it was Debbie's favorite uh, cousin was Sori. And when Sori was pregnant with Jay, I remember we used to go visit her all the time. And I think um, one of my gifts, I think, was the first gift that Sorry ever received for, for Jay. And I still didn't know Abby. Um, when I was 14, I guess it was in March, and my birthday's in April, Abby called. He wanted, he called on a weeknight and he asked for my mother. And he said, can Barbara go to a movie tonight with me? And she says, well, you'll have to ask Barbara. I mean, I can't answer for her. And my mom was really smart because, after all, I was still only 14. And uh, when he asked me, he thought I was 16 because my girlfriend, who was Dolores Adler, who was 16, he was getting a date f with uh, um, 
businessman who came, was coming in from Detroit, and he needed a date. Abby needed a date. So he thought we were both 16. Anyway, he called and asked <clears throat> if I could go to a movie. And um, I, I asked my mom, and he, she said, sure, if you want. So I went to the movie with Abby. He came to pick me up, <clears throat> and it was on, we were living on Carrick, and I, could, I was walking down our stairs, and he came running up the uh, steps onto the porch, and our door was half glass and half wood. And my eyes caught his, and honestly, this is the truth, my heart flipped over. And when he walked in, he was so self-conscious about taking me out that he said, first thing he said to me was, your hair looks terrible. <laughs> You know, and now that isn't, that really wasn't a hobby. Anyway, when we, <laughs> we went to a movie and uh, driving there, we were talking and then he said something about, well, well, how old are you? I said, I'm 14, I'll be 15 next month. He almost died, he, he couldn't believe it. Well, we argued that whole night. How we, old was he? 20, he had just turned 20. Oh. Yeah, so there was a big difference. So when we were, um, uh, I drive, right after the movie, yeah. yeah, right after the movie, and he dropped me off at home. He said, um, here's a dime, because how long ago it was, call me when you're 18. <laughs> so I said, you know what, I'll take the dime, but I wouldn't waste it on you. Well, we, we really had fought the whole night. And uh, the next time we went out, um, that was in March, the next time was in June. And my uncle uh, Shiki lived with us, my grandfather, my uncle Shiki, because my grandmother had just died. And they were living with us, and Abby and Shiki were best pals. They've been, they took um, um, flying lessons together. They had, Abby had his pilot's license. And um, anyway, he called Shiki to see if he could get a date. As uh, Shiki, no, how did it work? Oh, Shiki had a date, that was it, for a, a Jewish girl from Carolina, North Carolina. I think it was one of the Sherman's uh, nieces or something, Nate Sherman. And uh, he wanted Abby to get a date. And um, Abby, by this time, all the kids had gone, all the girls were at camp, or counselors or whatever. And he called back to say he couldn't get a date. And I answered. And he said to me, you know what, kid? I'm going to give you a break. I'm going to take you out tonight. So anyway, he was still very self-conscious. So we uh, went out with Shiki and his, and his date. And then uh, the next time we went out with just Shiki, and then the next time we left Shiki home. And, I think from that time until we married, I think there was maybe one day that we didn't see each other. He used to pick me up at school, drive me home, help me with my homework. Um, he was like a brother to my sisters, um, especially Sandy. I mean, Sandy was only uh, nine at the time. And uh, he used to give them allowance, weekly allowance. He used to take them to movies. And, uh, but he never would let me say we were going steady. He thought that was very corny. After all, he was 20. How can you, you know, say he was going steady with a 15-year-old girl? And this boy called me in the latter part of August for a date in October. And those days they did that because it was um, uh, AZA and the Alp Salon. It was the, uh, the boys' fraternities. And it was a big weekend, and he called to see if I could go. And I, Abby was at the house, and I put my hand over the phone, and I said, Abby, can I say I'm going steady? And he said, no. He said, you don't, you don't say you're going steady. I said, but how can I give him an excuse two months in advance? He says, you'll think of something. So I accepted. Huh. And Abby, that night that I went out with him, took um, Sandy and Helen to the movies. It was a Saturday night. And uh, he came back to the house, and he waited till I, till I got home. And uh, from then on, he says, you tell them what you have to tell them, but don't you go out again with anyone else. And uh, then we were married the following December. How old were you? I was 16. And in those days, was that still considered? Yes, very young, very young. But I had, um, I grew up very quickly. I, uh, I came from a, a family that was um, very rich in, in love and, and laughter, but very poor money. Um, I know that we lived with my grandmother in Hamilton until we moved to London, which was when I was six. And then we lived with my father's grandmother and her daughter and her children in London. My bedroom was the hall. Uh, Helen uh, stayed with my mom and dad in, a, in their bedroom. 
but until um, I guess maybe until after Sandy was born, we didn't have a place of our own. So we rented my they rented a home in London, and um, I think a, a cousin of my dad's had to loan my dad a hundred dollars to get my mother out of the hospital. Otherwise, Sandy would still be there. And um, but we had a very we had a wonderful life, a w wonderful family. My dad was always laughing, and he. He, um, he was on the road a lot when he came home on weekends. Uh, he spent as much time with us as he could. He used to take us to all the baseball games and the hockey games. I think he really wanted a boy. And um, Join the club. Car yeah, carnivals and, you know, he, he was just a big kid at heart. And so it was, it was easy growing up. And, but I had a lot of responsibilities. I used to have to take care of my kid sisters when I was nine years old. Um, my mother had to work, and we also had boarders. Ada Florin, as a matter of fact, boarded with us when she went to Western. Hmm. So, and we, my mother had a three-bedroom home and, and uh, one bathroom, and uh, so it was. Um, it wasn't an easy, you know, easy time for my parents, and a lot of responsibility was on my shoulders, especially for uh, Saturdays. So my mom in the summer would pack up challah sandwiches gave me a dime for drinks for each of the kids, for each of us, this, I was nine years old, gave me a, a blanket and the lunch and put us on a train to um, St. Thomas where there was water and I put out the blanket and I watched my two kid sisters, three and six, until it was time to come home. And I was nine. Mm -hmm. So I did mature faster. It doesn't mean I was sophisticated by any means, but I did mature with responsibility. So when I got married at 16, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a terrible shock to my parents, although they would have certainly have preferred I, I waited. Mm -hmm. How did Dolly and Frank react? They weren't thrilled, and I don't blame them. I was very young. Did you have a big wedding? Um, Abby refused to have um, people at the ceremony. He felt that there are three times in your life that should be very private. When you're born, uh, when you get married, and when you die, you have no choice and you're alone. Um, he had some relatives he really didn't want at the ceremony because he didn't feel that they were really wishing him well. And um, so therefore we had a very, we only had 20 at the, at the chuppah was at my mother's house, mom and dad's, and uh, then we went back to the shul for a family dinner. We got married Friday afternoon, we had a Friday night Shabbos dinner at shul. It was in the winter, and uh, there was 225 people, and all family. All family? All family. What was your wedding date? December 17. What year? 1948. And the night before our wedding was the 16th, Thursday night and we had a terrible, horrendous snowstorm and um, the caterer couldn't get to the shul and somehow or other my mother and Dolly got to the shul and they plucked the chickens and they cleaned and they got everything ready and the only way they could get home, you couldn't get a cab, you couldn't drive in, was by, by the hearse that the, sh that the shul had and then they rode home in a, in a hearse. <laughs> well, I didn't know if that was a good side or a bad side. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how we got married. So can you talk a bit about um, <clears throat> the, um, your early married life and include in it that story, that great story you told the other night with... Uh, with Booby Dolly, but that wasn't early. That was later. That so was start, later. Okay, so leave that for now. Talk yeah. about late, earlier, like what was, were you close with your in-laws? Um, when we first got married, something very unusual, Abby said to me, you're marrying me and you're not marrying my family. And I feel the same way about your family. He said, first and foremost come each other and then comes our families. And thank God I felt very close to Bobby and, and uh, Dee Dee. Although I, I was so young, I was intimidated terribly by the family. I mean, you know how strong everybody is in that family. Yeah. And I was, I think I sat quietly like a mouse for a lot of years. And, um, no, it, like any in-law, you know, a child coming into a family, it was difficult yeah. at first for everybody to make that kind of adjustment. Mm -hmm. But they were wonderful to me, always were. Were you closer to Dolly or to Frank? Or, or? Oh, to Dolly, because it was harder to get to Frank. Really? Oh, yeah. I loved Dee Dee. He was always good to me, but I didn't know he could talk. 
until at the wedding. I, every time I went over to the house, he was sleeping. <coughs> Excuse me. He worked very hard, and uh, his time at home was relaxing. Although everyone thought he was sleeping, he could repeat every word that every conversation that went on. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, he was wonderful to me, but it felt closer to Dolly, of course. Where did you live? After you got when we first got married, we moved into an apartment. Um, housing was very hard to get because it was shortly after the war, mm -hmm. and um, the housing still hadn't caught up to the population. And uh, we were very lucky. My dad knew someone who owned an apartment house, and we didn't have a place to live when we left on our honeymoon. But during the time we were away, we were away for two weeks, uh, my dad found this apartment for us. Where and was um, East, uh, it was on um, Emerald Street, and, uh, which wasn't the greatest district, but it didn't matter. And it was a walk up, we were on the third floor, and uh, the roof was flat, so we were on the top floor, and it was hot. It was such a hot apartment in the, uh, in the, in the summer, it was just dreadful. We, we had a corner bedroom and one window, but you could hear the breeze go by. <laughs> we wanted to pull it in, there was no air conditioning in those days. But um, no, it, it was, it didn't matter, it was just a happy time. I, our marriage just was remarkable, really. So you had your three kids. Well, we had trouble, I had trouble conceiving. I wanted a family immediately, Abby didn't. But um, we started trying a year after we were married and uh, um, I had trouble conceiving. I had to have my tubes blown quite a few times and I had a million tests and uh, we took the temperature and Abby came running home at noon. Oh, really? And oh yeah, all this fun and games. And uh, then actually we had our application in for adoption when um, and we were signing the papers the month that I conceived with Karen. And so how long had you been married before you got pregnant with Karen? Four years. And uh, then that was there was five years between Karen and Lori and uh, Judy was an absolute shock because we thought well that would have been it we would never have any more mm -hmm. and then Judy came along two and a half years later mm -hmm. and we would have liked more but it just never happened. Mm -hmm. Did Abby want a boy? He didn't care. He, he, I can honestly say he did not care. Not at all. He was just so thrilled. And because we had trouble conceiving, I think each child was so special to us, you know, that it didn't matter to us really one way or the other. So um, I think what strikes, struck me most about Abby and also what other people say was that he really took after his father in terms of um, personality. I think so too, except that they had um, different values only in family values. Frank's family was very important to him. I would say that his own immediate family, his own brothers, really took precedent over his kids. Frank's? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Not that he didn't love his children, he did, but he, he spent his like, you know, waking hours with his brothers and he called his sisters constantly. and. Uh, his concern really was there when he knew Dolly was doing a good job with the kids, it didn't bother him. He didn't have a lot of time to spend with the kids. He really worked very hard. And uh, that was the generation that really didn't know how to hold an infant and what to do with a child and all this. So was Dee kind of an absentee father? He was there, but he wasn't there. He was there, but he would be sleeping, that type of thing. He wasn't absentee as far as uh, not loving the kids and not being, you know, home for meals. Really present in their lives, I don't think out. he was a strong presence uh, as far as the kind of fathers that took them to ball games and mm -hmm. things like that. Now I could be very wrong. Maybe this is just what I got from Abby. Mm -hmm. I don't know how Marvin felt or sorry. Well, but I'm sure each kid's experience was different. <coughs> well, of course, because everybody's yeah. in a different position in the family. Right. But that his Abby's respect for his father and uh, his attitude to people and his respect for people, mm -hmm. Frank's respect for people, was something that Abby tried to emulate. Mm -hmm. His um, his mannerisms with people. He was he's really a very kind man, and um, it was very important to Abby to to be um, you know sort of joined to Frank that way. Mm -hmm. Someone was just telling me the other day, I think it was uh, High Kaplan, that 
in the old office on Robert Street when mm -hmm. D was going to the back room to get something. Like it would take him a half an hour to get there because yeah. he'd stop and talk to, to everybody. To everybody. Yeah. And that reminded me of Avi. Yeah. He was, uh, people were important to Avi. Yeah. He was a people person. He hated parties, hated them with a passion because he loved people individually, but he, he found parties very phony. He says, you stand and talk and how's the weather and how are the kids and no one's listening to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, he really didn't like parties, mm -hmm. but he loved people one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, actually dad really was turned on by people. I think Frank really was turned on by people. And I found that as Abby got older, business people turned him on too. He felt he had to be on for business people, whereas when he came home, he was tired, just like Dad was. And you know, he was, that was when, it was his relaxing time. Mm -hmm. But um, Abby's children were, like I think he spent so much time with his kid because d he didn't have that time with Dad, you know? And I know that when our children were young, by the, when they were six months old, he didn't like to handle them too much when they were much younger. But when they were six months old and able to sit, he wouldn't let me bathe them. He had a, I had a way to put them to bed at night so that he could come home and bathe the kids and read them stories and he wanted to be the one to do that. And in those days, that was very unusual. That was very, he was, uh, he was a, I was a liberated woman long before there was such mm -hmm. a thing as a liberated woman. Mm -hmm. But it, it sort of went two ways because there was never a time that Abby called at five or 5.30 or six to say that he was bringing somebody home like Don Glennie or business people, whoever was in the office with him, he would just bring them home for dinner. So, I mean, I was always prepared to have whoever he brought home. So, I mean, I think um, as though, although I was liberated as far as having a husband who was willing to do the vacuuming and help with the kids and things like that, I, I, I think we both uh, had that mutual respect for each other. And what about his um, ties to the shul? Was that always there or did that develop later? His ties to the to religion was always there. The ties to the shul really came through my father. My father was president for over 10 years of the, of the synagogue. And then when he uh, stepped down a few years later, they needed someone and they called my dad back. So, I mean, politics, shul politics, whatever, it was always being discussed Friday night dinners. And, uh, and my father used to say to Abby, uh, someday, you're going to be president. And he says, never, Max, never. I will never speak publicly, never. He said, you don't know me, Max. I will never do this. I will. He said, someday, Abby, you'll see. And um, he did. And he became uh, chairman of um, UJA and uh, the Bonds at one point. And um, yeah, he, he became very involved in, in the uh, community. So did he get over that fear of public speaking? No, he always hated it. He hated being in the limelight. He much preferred giving other people credit anyway. Whatever he had done, it was always because somebody said this or did this or helped him do this. And he, I, he would always say, I could never do it alone, which you can't. But I mean, he was always the first person to give credit to somebody. Far more often too much than uh, was necessary, but that was his way of doing things. I think Dad was very much like that too. So would you, would you have uh, said that he was a religious person? He was a tradi traditionalist. He wasn't really, uh, you know, it's hard to get into somebody's mind. I can tell you that he was more of a traditionalist until I got sick. And then he got a great deal of comfort out of going to the synagogue. Um, I don't think he was making deals with God, and I don't think he was talking to God, but I think he felt comfortable in shul. And I think it was, I think Rabbi Silverman also gave him a great deal of comfort. So I don't know what to say. I mean, up until then, I would say he was not religious. He was definitely traditionalist. And it was important to him. The tradition was very important to him. It, it, it was like a cohesiveness to, to him and his life. And can you talk a bit about what, what work meant to him? Did he, how much a part of his life was Intermeco? And Intermeco was not as much a part of his life because he couldn't get a footing in Intermeco. Um, Marvin was very dominant. Um, Frank was still very dominant. The Levies were still in there. Abby was not a pushy type of person. And um, 
he just could not get a, a, a toehold, really. He was really happiest when he was building at Parkdale. Parkdale was really his baby. And I think he did exceptionally well because he was able to administrate exceptionally well. He trusted people he chose. Uh, he knew he couldn't do everything. Um, he wasn't capable of doing everything he didn't want to be. Um, he, um, yeah, I think he chose his people very well and he trusted them. And <laughs> his relationship with business people was remarkable. He had a wonderful networking. He, um, he started, I guess, 50 years ago. It's, well, now it's 50 years ago when we were, when we were first married with people like Don Glennie and um, Bill Plum and Jack McDonald and, and then a little later the, uh, some people who became vice presidents like Bob Aino and uh, he started when they were in insignificant areas and always treated them very well. And they grew with Avi and they never forgot the fact that he treated them like they were big shots when they were just in very lower positions. And I think that's, that's how he, you know, he developed his business acumen. And he, he got a lot of that from Dad. Dad would do the same thing. Mm. Can you talk about some of the, the letters you got after he died, the tributes? And the I got some beautiful letters um, from people that we hadn't seen or heard from in, in many years. Um, one young man, uh, he's no longer a young man, but we met him when they were, he was first married and he was marrying, he married a picket, which is sort of like a circle is going around now because Jay Goldblatt is marrying the granddaughter of one of the pickets. Um, she is a very sweet girl and um, they, he was just a salesman and he was not appreciated by the family at all. John Marshall was his name. and. Um, when they first got married, they lived in a building right beside us, and we were still in the apartment. And uh, we became good friends, and uh, we saw them, I think, just for a couple of years because she had baby after baby. I think she had six kids in seven years or something like that. And our interests and you know our needs were became so different. But we were good friends at first, and we ha we sort of helped them out a little bit because even financially they didn't have very much because her family wouldn't help and he was just starting out. And we haven't heard from them in 45 years. And I got a beautiful card from them. And um, I mean, there were a lot of people like that who, who um, wrote how letters. How people's lives, do you think? What was the... <clears throat> I, I'm not sure how everybody was touched by Avi, but I think because he, he um, sincerely liked people and liked the people he was with. And he never let a relationship go by. I mean, he wouldn't, you know, I, like with Sumi and, and Isabel and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Belle from the office. He used to take them out every couple of months for lunch. He wanted to keep in touch with them. He, he used to call them just to see how they were feeling. Uh, he, um, he was sincerely interested in people. And he was very generous, and um, there were a lot of people who needed things, and uh, he would help them but without, I, I mean, so many people that I didn't know anything about until after he died, and I got these letters. Mm -hmm. One from a young man who was a friend of George Levinson's, who was Abby's younger cousin, um, Abby loaned, who Abby loaned money to when he was in trouble, I guess when Abby was 19 or 20, and Abby didn't have that much. And um, oh, I guess he was about 18 or 19, Abby. And this young man had had uh, a, a dent in the car of his father, who was away on vacation. He wasn't supposed to be driving it. And uh, didn't know who to go to for some money to help, you know, so he could get the car fixed before his father came back. Apparently, this young man's father was quite abusive. And Abby gave him the money without, you know, saying when he had to give it back or anything like that. And I got a letter from him. He's, uh, this young man's a lawyer now. And uh, I didn't even know that Abby knew him, to tell you the truth. But I mean, it was people like that that, he's, that we got all these beautiful notes and letters from. I also remember you mentioning that he could never do anything for himself without feeling he had to, at the same time, do something for someone else, like renovate the house. Yes, yeah, so when we renovated uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it was the first time, I think, that we had really 
spent a great deal of money on the house at one time. I mean, we had, after we bought it, we decorated just so much of it. And for example, we didn't have a dining room table for the first 15 years we lived in the house. And uh, I mean, things like that. But we did what we wanted at the beginning, you know, things that were important, like putting in the pool for the children, because you know, I hated cottage life, so we wanted them to swim. But um, when we fixed the house up, and it, it, it was quite expensive, he said, I just don't feel comfortable spending this kind of money when there's so many people who are homeless and, and hungry. And he took half the amount that we spent, it was quite a bit, and um, spread it around the city, whether it was, um, it didn't have to be Jewish um, charities, it was. How did he choose the charities he gave to? He chose the charities as he saw the needs. He just. He'd read about something in the paper or he. Yes, well, he knew about the, the mission, uh, you know, for feeding. Uh, actually, um, it started quite a while ago with us, uh, I, I would say about 20 years ago. Um, we chose a family. We would choose a family that needed, um, that had no money and at Christmas time. And um, I would buy the food and, and um, find out through a church about the children, their ages, and we'd buy gifts and stuff. So they would have a Christmas. So it never bothered Abby to whether it was a Jewish mm -hmm. you know, charity or not. I mean, he just felt the need to help somebody else when he had so much. Mm -hmm. That's very much a gold black trade, isn't yes. it? Yes. Oh, yeah. The compulsion almost to give. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because of, of the, uh, I don't even know if it's guilt that they have so much. I, I know Abby felt very guilty yeah. uh, uh, quite often about having what he had. And uh, I, I don't know if, I don't think it's just guilt, but no. it was, I think that had a lot. To, it was, it, yeah. It was a motivation anyway. All right, can we just shift a little bit? Can sure. You, can you t talk about, um, that, tell that great story about Dolly? Oh, that was really very funny. It was very, it's a, actually, it's a joke. Um, Did that it really some could, was it true? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, no. It, but it, it, it is a joke that comedians do tell. They used to tell in the Catskills and whatever. Um, I did try very hard to conceive, I told you. But um, I love golf. It was my very favorite sport. And um, we took it up together, Abby and I, before we had kids. And uh, so, because, so we would have something to do together. And um, so I used to golf four days a week. And no one knew, but I used to get up at five in the morning. I would do the laundry and I would prepare, you know, get the breakfast, get the kids ready and whatever. And so that the help that I had would do nothing but play with the kids. And then I would play early in the morning and I would be back by one o'clock. Um, but my, no, yeah, I didn't tell anybody that. So I used to, you know, I'd leave the house around 8, 30. And I, this one particular day, I saw my mother standing on the corner of Longwood and Maine. And I turned the corner and she came over and, and she said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to pick up Sori to golf. And at that point, Sori re really was a, a beginner. She really wasn't a golfer. She hated it. But I said, sorry, if you don't want to get used to it, let me pick you up. We'll play, we'll play nine holes. She said, okay, okay. So I was going, well, sorry. So mom said, okay, great. I said, well, what are you doing? And then she, she said, well, I'm waiting for Dolly, who's picking me up. And we're going golfing. They used to play nine holes. And they used to bet on their putting. You know, they couldn't hit the ball. But by the time they got to the green, they were great. They were great putters because they used to bet a, a, a nickel on a putt. So. Dolly was picking up uh, my mom, and uh, she picked her up. And my mother said, uh, "I just saw Barbara." He says, "Oh, what's you know, where's she going?" She says, "Oh, she's going to the, the golf course." She says, "I don't understand these kids. She couldn't wait to have her family. She she tried so hard, and she's in strict direct. She's leaving the home three kids, and I can't believe it. She runs golfing every day." So my mother said, "Dolly, she's picking up sorry." She says, "Oh, that's so good. I am so glad sorry's getting out. I can't tell you, she never gets out." That was the true story. And then when my mother said to her, you know, Dolly, if it wasn't so funny, I'd be angry. <laughs> she really did say. But <coughs> it did happen. Even though it is a joke, it did happen. Well, what kind of a mother-in-law was, was Bubby? Yeah. No, she, was, um, she was the same to me as she was to her children. If she yelled at her children, she would yell at me. And it's something I found very difficult to get used to. Getting yelled at? Yes, of course. I she mean, never yelled at? Never. 
Never in my house, you didn't raise your voice. You never swore. And it wasn't because it was a law, it was just the way, the nature of our, our my mom and my dad. I mean, that was their nature. And uh, you had to get, I remember once, only once, I slapped my sister Helen. She did something and I can't remember and I slapped her. I was 13, I think, and my mother, who was quite harassed, she had worked all day and she was doing the supper and she was tired. And she came in and Helen was crying, uh, definitely not proportionately to the, what I hit her with, you know, that with kids. And my mother came up to me and slapped me on the face. She'd never been hit before by my mother or father. And she said, that's for hitting my child. When you have children, you can hit your own, but don't you dare raise your hand to one of my children. In other words, you know, you work it out, but you don't hit. Mm -hmm. And that stuck with me. I think I use that word, that expression to my kids. Mind you, my kids really never fought. Mm -hmm. but. So it, it was an adjustment because there was a lot of yelling going on and you weren't used to that. I never. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I could sit back and I felt like I was in a movie. <laughs> Never believed, you know, that anybody would do that. But as I say, as far as Booby was concerned, if she felt I needed to be yelled at, I was yelled at, you know? And uh, it didn't matter whether it was a child, a daughter, or a daughter-in-law, it was the same thing to her. And can you talk a bit about your relationship with my mother? Do you remember when my dad brought her home? And, and all um, that? I don't remember too much about that period because that was around the time Abby and I were getting married. Mm. Actually, no, we got married. No, yes, when he brought her home, we were just, just going to be married. I think they, it was about a year later that they got married themselves. Your mother was gorgeous, really beautiful, I remember. Uh, I remember Michael Sue. Uh, she was adorable. And um, I don't remember, I don't know, I remember your mother got pregnant right away, and it, that made me very jealous because I was trying so hard. I thought, oh my God, here she is, you know, she's pregnant before she came home on her honeymoon. And I'm trying so hard, but um, she had uh, Beverly, and then she became pregnant with Janet very quickly. And then I became pregnant around, around, uh, I think Janet and Karen are about six months apart, yeah, five Janet months apart, something like that. Yeah, yeah, Karen was born in, in January, following January. So th by that time, it was like, you know, but my kids were always, they always seemed so much younger than, uh, than your mom and dad's, mm -hmm. you know, they were never that close, except for Janet and Karen, yeah. So did you get to, did you have dinners, Friday night dinners in those days? Oh, yes. Frank and Dolly? Yeah. And what were their relationships like with Sori and Phil and my parents and you guys? Like, were you... Uh, we were never, we, Abby and I were sort of out of, out of the fold, more or less. I think your mother and, and Sori were very close, which was good. They were then more in common, they were closer in age. Um, Phil and Marvin were like oil and water, but because of the girls, they got along. Um, I think Phil was hard to get along with, with a lot of people, but Abby found him very easy to get along with. Um, but we, we were really never, close to any one group because our interests were so different, you know, and our kids were young. Yeah. I don't know. Then at one point you, you stopped coming and you went to, uh, you did things with your family. Oh no, never stopped going to Chavez. No? No, as but long as Booby had it. Oh, as long as, as, long as Booby had it, we were there. We were there every other fr uh, set of Friday. We never went every Friday because we always went one Friday to my parents right. and one Friday to so uh, just, Booby's. I, just, I guess I'm talking more about the Passover Seder, Rosh Hashanah dinners. No, we always we always had one uh, one uh, Pesach dinner with mom and uh, with Bobby and Didi, and one with my parents. Oh yes, always, never, never stopped doing that. Well, then you must have started doing your own one night. I mean, I must. When my there. parents, when my mother could no longer do it, yeah. then I had yeah, it. That's probably. That's when it stopped. Yeah, my mother, when my father had open heart surgery in March, and my we found out my mother only had four years, four or five years to live. The doctor said five years if she was lucky and ten if she wasn't. And uh, that was when we, they came back from Cleveland and my mother couldn't do it. And that was just a few weeks before Pesach. I remember it was the first Pesach I ever made. I didn't, had never made gefilte fish. I couldn't call my mother to ask for recipes or how to go about it because I couldn't, she couldn't have the phone ringing all the time. My dad was resting after surgery. 
and my mother didn't know she was as sick as she was. We knew, but she didn't know. They, they called my sisters and I in to tell us how bad her heart was. She wasn't operable. She had had um, a massive silent heart attack, and um, so her heart was really quite bad. But uh, I made that Pesach, and I remember making the gefilte fish with the eyes and the head. But they didn't take them out, and I didn't know I was supposed to. So who taught you how to make it? Nobody. I just followed a recipe. Actually, I called Gloria Silverman quite often that Pesa, and she helped me out. So you and Avi were very close to the Silvermans, weren't you? Yes. Yes. We were very fond of them. Mm -hmm. Nice people. Mm -hmm. Really, I uh, admire their family relationships, and I know it wasn't easy for them, for their children, very hard for their children being raised in a, in a, in a what do you call them, a fishbowl. Um, wherever they went and to school, we always seemed to have visited the city, we always took the girls out. And I remember asking them about how tough it was, and they said, oh yeah, it was really tough. So much was expected of them, and, uh, yeah. but I always felt that they were so fortunate that the children followed in their example and in their footsteps, because um, it's, you know, so often today children don't. Mm -hmm. And their grandchildren, I mean, I just, I just think that's a fabulous family. Mm -hmm. And you have a very close relationship with your grandchildren, don't you? Oh yes, mm -hmm. yeah. That's really, really what's important to me. Yeah, you're very hands-on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. More hands-on before when I had more energy. Mm -hmm. Um, but, for example, tomorrow uh, Adam called me, as my oldest grandson, he's 14, and he called me, excuse me, he called me to see, the well, school is out, could he spend a day or two with me, and you know, maybe we'll go golfing or we'll go to a movie. He calls me quite often since, especially since Abby died, and he sort of feels responsible, can he, you know, he stay here with me on the weekends when I'm home alone, and uh, things like that. And, um, yeah, very much so. And your kids have been a big support to you? Oh, my kids are wonderful, but sometimes even too much so. I mean, there are times when I need my space and my time alone. Because I really can't grieve with the, if they're with me. Mm -hmm. I mean, for their sake, I don't want to. And uh, so it, it's easier for me if I'm you know, on my own more. But the kids are wonderful. And my sons-in-law have been great. So I'm very fortunate, really. Um, with Norman has been wonderful. I don't know what I would do without him. I was 60 before I knew how to write a check. I never had to. I left home at 16 with my father taking care of me and moved into a relationship with the man who took care of me. And I never had to do anything. So um, it's, it, was a, it was a cultural shock, I'll tell you. So have you learned some things? I've learned a lot, but I know that I, what I've really learned is that I know nothing. <laughs> and I don't know, yeah, and that I don't know how much I'll ever learn. Yeah. I don't know too much about it. And it's really never been a priority of mine, so I'm very but fortunate you're a I have somebody. Now. I mean, you have I'm a working woman. I am not a businesswoman. I am a laborer. You're a laborer. I am a laborer. I have made sure, I must tell you, that um, my, my kids gave uh, Sandy a computer so it would be easier for her and they wanted me to learn how to do it with Sandy so I could do it. And because I'm not that well, and I am six years older than Sandy, I didn't want her to rely on me for anything. I wanted her to know how to do the books and the buying and everything else. I really and truly won't even do, I can do, and I have done the cakes. I prefer her to do everything. I will do the, ch I'm the, her sous chef. I do the chopping, I do the cutting, I do the, I'll do the curls, I'll do all the leg work, I'll do the nudgedic things that, you know, that it's, you know, to give her the chance to actually do the baking. Because if sometime in the, you know, in the near future I can't help her, she has to be on her own. So I've left her with the books, for sure. So does she do the computer stuff now? Yes. So she's learned? She's learned. Does she's she done like quite it? well. No, she hates it. <laughs> She would be much happier if she didn't have to make, we both hate using the phone, but I hate it for the passion. And for her to have to call people in business is just torture. She doesn't want to hire anyone to do that for her? No, she can't, she couldn't make any money. She wouldn't make money if she had to pay me. 
She couldn't. I mean, this is this is penny. This this is a penny business. Really? Oh yes. Yeah. There's no way you, she could do better financially in this business. Yes, if we went into a factory and did it uh, that way, but I can't imagine investing that kind of money. She's 60. She just turned 60. I can't imagine investing. She doesn't have the, that kind of money to begin with. This is why we went into business. Uh, and, and gamble on, you know, whether there's a market there for us or not. And I think the only reason why people like our baking is because it's homemade, it's fresh, we don't freeze. And, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, so it is hand to mouth sort of, you know. Yeah. And we work seven days a week. But is she bringing in like a? a oh, so, yes, yeah, she's yeah. bringing in especially at Christmas time. Christmas time is is the icing on the cake, and and during the year it's just bread and butter. I mean, we work hard are for you, restaurants. Are you interested in advertising in the Jewish neighborhood? No. You don't want to. You don't want to drum up more business. Not that way. It's very difficult. First of all, she doesn't want to become uh, known uh, through pay. We've been asked if we want to go into the Hamilton pay, uh, magazine or in the, you know, like a house business. And really, although she, she, she has a license to do this in her home, if her neighbors complained, we would have to stop. So we just don't want to be known that publicly. And it, by word of mouth, we're, we are quite busy. I mean, I don't know. I mean, she got an order today for 11 cakes for tomorrow. I mean, I don't know how much. And then that's on top of everything that we had to do this morning. She got it at noon. So I mean, with all the cakes we made this morning, you know, it's, uh, and then just making the cakes is only half of the, um, the work. It's decorating them the next day, and boxing them and then delivering. So I don't know how much more we can really do. Parties we've done, at, that's really where we would make money because, <coughs> excuse me, it's hard to make money when you're sell, ho selling wholesale. You make very little on a cake in, to a restaurant. But that's how we got known. It was through, and that was because of Bobby who would go to the Lepresis and say, "Have you ever tried my wife's cheesecakes?" Yeah. So that's how we got started in restaurants. So it's much better if we had.